and welcome to another video lecture on topic C1.1, Enzymes and Metabolism. This is our additional higher level content. SL friends, you're welcome to follow along for fun, but this will not be on your assessment. Our guiding questions continue to be in what ways do enzymes interact with other molecules and what are the interdependent components of metabolism. In our last lecture, we talked a lot about enzyme substrate interactions. Today, we're going to talk about some more of those interactions. We're also going to talk about how us living things manipulate the components of metabolism in order to regulate it. Our objectives, we're going to distinguish between intracellular and extracellular metabolism. We're going to distinguish between linear and cyclic pathways of metabolism and explain some of the mechanisms of enzyme inhibition. Remember that enzymes are proteins that catalyze chemical reactions. They are going to increase the rate of a reaction by decreasing the activation energy. Those reactions that enzymes catalyze are those reactions of metabolism, which can be catabolic or anabolic and are super interdependent and interacting in us living things. Metabolism can be inside cells, intracellular, or extracellular, outside cells. Here we've got some lovely plant cells with those chloroplasts. Of course, what happens in the chloroplasts is photosynthesis. Because photosynthesis is happening inside a chloroplast, inside a cell, it's intracellular. Cellular respiration is also an intracellular process because it's happening inside a mitochondria, which is in a cell. Digestion happens both along the walls of the small intestine and also in the lumen of the small intestine. This is happening outside the cells. Cells are making the enzymes. Cells are absorbing the nutrients after the breakdown of the food particles, but digestion itself, the breakdown of those food particles is happening outside of cells. It's extracellular. We can also classify our metabolic pathways as being either linear or cyclic. Our linear pathways like glycolysis, glycolysis, the splitting, that's the lysis part of glucose, that's the glyco part, starts with glucose. Lots and lots of enzymes are going to send glucose through these different intermediate steps, and we end up with these products that will eventually enter the mitochondria if oxygen levels are sufficient. I don't use any of these final products to restart the pathway. Certainly we reuse those enzymes, but the products are not reused here. That's different in our cyclic pathways where some of the products of some of the reactions are used to restart the whole entire pathway. Some of those products, again, are reused to start the pathway. This is cyclic, this is Calvin cycle, can you guess why we call it a cycle? Because it's a cyclic pathway. Another example of a cycle is Krebs cycle, which is part of respiration. Calvin cycle is part of photosynthesis. An interesting side effect of all these chemical reactions happening is the propagation of heat. Be careful, don't say that we produce heat energy because we know that energy can neither be created nor destroyed. A better word is propagate. Energy is released during chemical reactions, especially during cellular respiration. And us endotherms, us organisms that maintain an internal body temperature, we actually take advantage of cellular respiration and the heat energy that is propagated as those chemical reactions happen to keep us warm. Kind of cool. No, kind of warm. Remember that we talked in our last lecture about these factors that affect the rates of enzyme activity. We know that pH, there's an optimal pH, and if I deviate from that too much, those extreme pHs are going to denature our proteins, denature those enzymes, and then we lose the shape, that conformation, the structure of the enzyme, which prohibits it from being able to do its job. Temperature, we also have an optimal temperature. An increase in temperature means more collisions, more energetic collisions between the substrates and the enzymes. So we have an increase in the rate of reaction. If I 
increase the temperature much over the optimal temperature, we have a rapid decrease in the rate because, again, of denaturation. If I'm looking at substrate concentration, clearly, if I don't have any substrates, we're not going to have any activity. The more substrate we have, the faster our rate of reaction until our enzymes are saturated, and at that point, our rate will plateau. For the rest of this lecture, we're going to look at enzyme inhibition, more ways that we can affect the rate of enzyme activity, just like pH, temperature, substrate, concentration can affect the rate of enzyme activity. But here we have purposeful ways that us living things control the rate of enzyme activity and therefore regulate metabolism. The first kind of inhibition we're going to look at is competitive. Here we are literally competing for the active site of the enzyme. Here we have some normal interactions between the enzyme and the substrate. The two combine to make their enzyme substrate complex. The enzyme is going to put some strains on the chemical bonds, reduce the activation energy. So this catabolic reaction can occur. We've got our products here. In inhibition, competitive inhibition, I have some other molecule that is our inhibitor. The shape of the inhibitor is similar to the shape of the substrate. That allows the inhibitor to interact with the active site of the enzyme. And because the inhibitor is sitting there, the substrate cannot. And so the enzyme's activity is going to be reduced because the substrate can't get to the enzyme because this inhibitor is blocking the way. This is reversible. The inhibitor does not bind permanently to the enzyme. So as soon as it pops off, the substrate can get in there and the enzyme can continue some action on the substrate. Us humans have actually stolen the idea of competitive inhibitors to make medicine. Statins are medicines that lower blood cholesterol levels. Statins are competitive inhibitors in the metabolic pathways that make cholesterol in our bodies. We need cholesterol. We know that it maintains membrane fluidity. And so our liver has this lovely pathway to make cholesterol for us. But sometimes our livers make too much cholesterol. Sometimes we eat too much cholesterol. And then that increase in cholesterol can block blood vessels and lead to heart attacks. This is bad. So people can be prescribed statins. Statins are competitive inhibitors for that pathway that produces cholesterol. In this instance, provostatin is a competitive inhibitor for this enzyme, HMG-CoA reductase. HMG-CoA is this substrate. It binds to the active site. It gets turned into some other stuff that eventually gets turned into cholesterol. Provostatin will sit on the active site of that reductase enzyme preventing it from being able to take part in that pathway that makes cholesterol. That's going to reduce the amount of cholesterol that the liver is making and therefore reduce the amount of cholesterol that we have in our bodies. It is simply a competitive inhibitor for this enzyme that is part of the cholesterol metabolic pathway. What's super cool here, we can see that the statins, and again, this one happens to be provostatin. With provostatin, the incidence of death or non-fatal heart attacks is much lower, maybe not much lower, is a little lower than people who only had the placebo. So that reduction in cholesterol is having a positive impact on the longevity of people taking the medicine. Another type of inhibition is non-competitive. In competitive inhibition, the substrate and the inhibitor compete for the active site of the enzyme. With non-competitive inhibition, we're not competing for the active site. Instead, the inhibitor will bind to some other part, not the active site of the enzyme. That other part is called the allosteric site. I remember it because allo is kind of like there, allá in Spanish, over there. So not here on the active site, but over there, allá on the allosteric site. When the inhibitor binds to the allosteric site, it causes a shape change to the active site. And therefore, the substrate can no longer bind to the active site. They don't have a shape match anymore, and the reaction will be inhibited. This is reversible. 
that inhibitor can pop off the enzyme, the enzyme's shape will go back to normal and the substrate can bind again. Non-competitive inhibition. We are not competing for the active site anymore, but instead binding to the allosteric site, which causes a shape change to the active site, which prevents reactions from happening. This is reversible. The active site can go back to normal when the inhibitor releases from the enzyme. This graph is showing us how substrate concentration affects the rate of enzyme activity. No substrate, no reaction makes sense. The more substrate we have, that increase in substrate concentration is going to lead to an increase in the rate of activity until all of our enzymes are saturated. So this green line is showing us no inhibition. This blue line is showing us with a competitive inhibitor. Notice that the rate is reduced until we get to a very high substrate concentration. Imagine at this very high substrate concentration, maybe we have a thousand pieces of substrate and only two pieces of inhibitor. Statistically, that substrate is going to get to the enzyme way more frequently than that little bit of inhibitor is. So we're not going to have much of a decrease in the rate of reaction simply because that substrate at such a high concentration is going to get to the active site more frequently than does the inhibitor. Our non-competitive inhibitors also decrease the rate of reaction, but because they're binding to the allosteric site, not to the active site of the enzyme, it doesn't matter how much substrate we have, the allosteric site is still free for the non-competitive inhibitor. And so the rate is going to be much decreased. Us living things will put inhibitors into place to reduce the rate of reaction, either a lot or a little, depending on what we need to do to control those metabolic processes. Another way that we can classify inhibition is by feedback. In feedback inhibition, the end product of a metabolic pathway becomes the inhibitor. So here we have our substrate, we've got our enzyme, the substrate enzyme complex is here. In this pathway, we have a couple of different intermediates. So this guy will turn into the purple guy. The purple guy will bind to a different enzyme. And then we have the blue guy being produced. The blue guy will bind to yet another enzyme. And then we end up with our end product. If I have lots of end product, there's no reason to waste energy making more end product. And so the end product can actually act as the inhibitor for the whole entire pathway. We will often inhibit the very first enzyme in the pathway because why would we waste energy on this stuff only to block the process over here? This instance, we have our end product acting as a non-competitive inhibitor because it is binding to the allosteric site, not to the active site. Notice we have that lovely shape change of the active site, which prevents the substrate from binding. If this isn't happening, then none of this happens, and then I don't have any more end product. Of course, if we start to run low on that end product, we no longer have this inhibition and the pathway will begin again. The production of the amino acid isoleucine from this other amino acid threonine is an example of a pathway that has feedback inhibition. Isoleucine for us humans is an essential amino acid. That means that we cannot make it. We do not have this pathway we have to have isoleucine in our diets. Plants and bacteria, however, can take that threonine and turn it into isoleucine, and then we eat the plants to get the isoleucine. When we have, when plants and bacteria, because we're not this cool, when plants and bacteria have sufficient levels of isoleucine, there is no reason to waste the energy or the threonine to make more isoleucine. So isoleucine at high levels will bind to the allosteric site of enzyme number one. Remember that the allosteric site means that it is a non-competitive inhibitor. That enzyme and the isoleucine bound together will prevent anything from happening in this whole entire pathway. The whole pathway is blocked. However, 
if we have low levels of isoleucine. That isoleucine is not there to bind to the allosteric site, then the threonine is converted into this first intermediate and then all these other ones, lots of enzymes, and we get that isoleucine. If we get that isoleucine and that level rises, isoleucine will bind to the allosteric site of enzyme number one and shut down the process so that we're not, again, wasting energy, wasting resources, making a product that we don't need. Feedback inhibition. We're going to look here at one last kind of inhibition, mechanism-based inhibition. This is super similar to competitive inhibition. We have this enzyme here called transpeptidase. It is used by bacteria to build cell walls. It binds together these different peptide chains on these glycoproteins to help the bacteria build new cell wall. Penicillin, the antibiotic penicillin, is a competitive inhibitor. It will bind to the active site of the transpeptidase enzyme, except it binds permanently with the other ooh, permanently sorry lost my lost my spelling trying to thought there um when we looked at the other competitive inhibitor it did not bind permanently instead that inhibition was reversible the inhibitor can pop off of the enzyme and the enzyme can go back to doing work this mechanism-based inhibition is permanent it is forever that penicillin will be stuck there forever. And so it doesn't matter if we have that increase in substrate concentration, this enzyme is dead. It can no longer act on its substrate ever. And this is how penicillin helps us treat bacterial infections. If we can prevent forever the bacteria from being able to make more cell wall, then the bacteria is going to die. It cannot grow. It cannot make babies. It gives our immune system time to go in there and kill off the bacteria. This is how penicillin works. It is a mechanism-based permanent inhibition. Sadly, well, sadly for us humans, not for the bacteria, good for them. Um, there are some bacteria that make an enzyme called penicillin ACE. If it ends in ACE, it's an enzyme. This guy, you probably guessed, acts on penicillin. And this is going to confer antibiotic resistance against penicillin to the bacteria that make it. This is the penicillin molecule. One part of the penicillin molecule is this super cool square ring called the beta-lactam ring. Penicillin ACE is a example of an enzyme in the family of beta-lactam ACEs that literally just break that beta-lactam ring. When that ring gets broken, notice over here, no square ring. When that ring, ring is broken, Penicillin, which is now penicilloic acid, no longer has the right shape to bind permanently to the active site of that transpeptidase enzyme that we looked at on the previous slide. If penicillin, now penicilloic acid, can no longer permanently bind to the active site of the transpeptidase, transpeptidase can just do its job and make more cell wall for the bacteria, which can live happily ever after infecting us. So that's bad for us. And on that sad, bad note, we have come to the end of our video lecture. We talked about intracellular versus extracellular metabolism, lots of metabolism that happens inside cells. We talked about examples in photosynthesis and respiration. Extracellular digestion happens in our small intestine, but outside of cells. We talked about linear pathways like glycolysis, cyclic pathways where some of the products turn into some of the reactants in that metabolic pathway. And then we talked about lots of ways that we can inhibit our enzymes to better control metabolism. Great work today, my friends.